Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask a Property Manager. This is episode number 53. Today is January 6, 2021, and this is our first show of the year. Uh, we're coming to you from Studio 2.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo, Inc. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about some changes to the New York State 485A property tax exemption, what, should you, what you should do at the end of a tenant's lease term, what to do when the dryer stops drying, and we're going to answer some questions from housing providers around the country, and so much more. Before we jump into that, we're going to plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Follow us on Facebook to watch those live, facebook.com slash buffalo foreclosed homes. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can catch the replays on the same day over at youtube.com slash own buffalo as well. Uh, we're going to jump right into things here this morning. I wanted to start off, if you are a New York State viewer and you are concerned about the recent extension of the eviction moratorium, I put together a fairly extensive video on this topic. It's about a half hour long, but you can definitely kind of jump through it and pick through to, to find the pieces of the puzzle that you need. Um, you can find that over on our YouTube page. You can also find a link to it over on our Facebook page as well. Uh, and again, that's a pretty long video but it does go really in depth, like literally page by page of the legislation. Uh, and you can see here, like we, we go through, I've highlighted certain sections of it to break it out. It's worth taking a look at if you're a New York State landlord and you're not sure what your options are, given where we stand currently with regards to the eviction moratorium. So if you're looking for that information, that's where it's available. Let's jump right into our news of the day. We're gonna start with a little bit of a feel good story. I know it's the New York Post. Please don't, <laughs> you know, it's a feel good story. It's regardless of whether the fact it's the New York Post or not. Uh, it's kind of a unique set of circumstances, which is why I wanted to, uh, to go through this article. Meet the New York City man living in a 22,000 square foot mansion rent free. Roy Fox hasn't paid his rent, hasn't paid rent for his New York City apartment in more than 30 years, but he's not sweating an eviction. In a city of 8.4 million people, Fox, aged 81, is just one of 23 lucky New Yorkers who reside in one of the city's publicly owned historic sites spread across the five boroughs. After working as a radio host in cities from his native Chicago to Detroit and Pittsburgh, Fox, a gregarious rascal brimming with well-worn one-liners, happened upon an offer he couldn't refuse, a chance to live rent-free in the King Manor House, an 11-acre historic landmark in Jamaica, Queens. The only catch, serving as its caretaker. He never signed a contract or agreed to any concrete terms, but that was more than 30 years ago. Who's counting? I just opened and closed the place, Fox said of the 1806 built museum dwelling, sections of which date back to 1700. Work hardly comes to mind. While he doesn't earn a salary, Fox also doesn't have to pay a dime to live in one of the biggest houses in the most expensive cities in the world. It's payment for all the years I've done doing nothing, Fox joked of his role in the 29-room, 22,000-square-foot historic mansion. In the late 1980s, Fox's then-wife had a job restoring the carousel at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Her boss tipped her off that the parks commissioner was looking for someone to live in King Manor, and the rest is history. It was such a New York story, Fo said Fox, of the serendipity of finding his beloved home. Fox was lucky enough to arrive in 1989, just as the centuries-old manor once owned by Rufus King, one of the five framers of the U.S. Constitution and a vocal abolitionist, whose son Charles King and John Alsop King became president of Columbia College and the governor of New York, respectively, was undergoing renovations. The, beginning of, the beginnings of anti-racism were here at King Manor with this family and others like them, Fox said. I'm housebound, but what a house to be bound in. His timing gave him the opportunity to advocate for how the old servant's quarters, soon to be his own apart apartment, were to be redesigned. His two-bedroom home, on the third and top floor of the estate is oddly shaped thanks to a 19th century renovation that clumsily combined the three original buildings on the farm. Fox's apartment includes a combined kitchen and dining room, an office, which sits four steps below the rest of his apartment, one bathroom and two bedrooms, but he frequently abandons his king-sized bedroom in favor of a snooze on his spare bedroom pullout. Connected to his office and separated from the rest of the mansion is a tiny pink room, it's, preserved, it's presumed to have originally acted as a child's room for warmer seasons, as it doesn't have a fireplace. 
Fox stopped the crew from closing off the kitchen, as was in the blueprint, to maintain the more open dining space, though he admittedly doesn't cook. A sign hangs in the kitchen that reads, This kitchen is here because it came with the place. He does, however, make snacks. A popcorn machine stands at the ready, eager to be fed the special yellow kernels Fox picks up at the Union Square Farmer's Market. Before COVID, he accepted guests, old friends, kings, scholars, and manor staff for popcorn, beer, and an animated history lesson. But today, he lives almost alone. His first and then second marriages didn't stick, and he never had children, save for his beloved feline roommate, Supercat, a stray who abducted him a year and a half ago. However, over the years in his role as caretaker, Fox has accumulated a large family of museum staff, researchers, community members, and friends. Fox is the heart of King Manor, said King Manor Executive Director Kelsey Brow. Years pass, and the Fox still remains in the house. He always says, King Manor, like no other museum. Well, there is no other caretaker like our Fox. The center of Fox's unique home is his office, where he spends the day at a simple wooden desk angled next to the best window, which provides a magnificent view of the green grounds that surround the estate. Turn 180 degrees, and another window offers a peek at bustling Jamaica Avenue. His space is simply outfitted with the expection exception of a festive four-foot-tall spruce tree that a friend gifted him. Fox decorated it with white Christmas lights. It's like me. It's hysterical, not historical, Fox said of his decor. I'm not big on furniture. There are no antiques or other historic artifacts in his living quarters. He said he likes to keep all the history downstairs in the more public-facing manner. Down there, he loves to admire the oversized U.S. Constitution that rests on the table in the living room below and the life-size statue of King. Fox makes a game of sneaking objects like books and a paper copy of the Constitution into the statue's hands to amuse visitors. You won't find a TV in Fox's den. He hasn't owned one since 1982 when he gave his away to a homeless guy. But what he doesn't have in 21st century entertainment or fancy knickknacks he makes up for in books. Fox owns more than 4,000 pieces of literature from the historic and significant to today's bestsellers. Uh, the apartment has so many books that it beats out King's own collection of 3,200 books, many of which now reside in the Library of Congress. Uh, I feel like I'm surrounded by my friends, Fox said of his massive book collection. Fox reads and writes voraciously, always carrying a pen and a piece of paper with him around, the, uh, around his apartment and the house, taking notes, capturing quotes, and circling passages in books. Fox said he's unbothered by the solitude of shuffling around a giant manor and months of no visitors. The museum just reopened in September with three tours a day and advanced registration is required. He's content with his books, his cat, and the history in the floorboards. He's also super unperturbed at the thought that the spirits of the historic figures may be rattling around in the night when he is on the property alone. Haunted? The only thing scary in this building is me, Fox laughed, noting the exception of Super Cat. From the moment I come into the apartment, she's by my side. So normally, like, we don't cover a lot of feel-good stories on the, on the show. It's not typically what we're here to do. But I read this, and it was just, it was amusing to me. I thought that it was a cool little story, a nice way to start off 2021. Uh, something tangentially real estate related while still having a little bit of humor value. Uh, just a good story all the way around. It's, what a unique set of circumstances, though, to find yourself in a situation where you get to live in one of the largest mansions in the city of New York rent-free for 30 years um just what a it's basically a situation of right place right time so what a cool little story uh, i wanted to read that one out to you guys just to start 2021 off on the right foot now we're going to jump over to an article this was published in buffalo business first and this is going to be more relevant to our new york state audience um title of the article is paid sick leave and other new state mandates taking effect in new york this week um, specifically, I wanted to scroll down and look at the new requirements for the 485A exemption. So if you're not familiar with the 485A exemption, ex especially, essentially what it did or does is offers a property tax exemption for the redevelopment of a structure, and it has to meet certain criteria. And it has to be essentially a, you can have a commercial rehab and it has to have a residential component to it in order to qualify for that 485A um, tax ex sorry, property tax exemption. There's a lot more to it. I'm kind of glossing over the surface of, surface of how it all works. But the main thing that you need to understand here is that it was being widely abused by developers. They would do a large rehab of a commercial structure and add one residential unit in so that it technically met the requirements of the 485A program. And they would wind up getting some sort of a property tax reduction or exemption as a result of that. So the state has gone through and made some updates to that exemption. Uh, and we're gonna just go through here and kind of touch on some of this here. 
Um, let's see, this is in effect as of January 1st. And this is as a result of reports in Buffalo, Albany, Syracuse, and elsewhere found that the exemptions were often being used incorrectly. The state legislature passed the bill over the summer and Cuomo signed it earlier this month. The program was intended to incentivize the redevelopment of older buildings by allowing municipalities to offer a 12-year exemption on property taxes to developers who renovate these buildings to include commercial and residential space. Pretty much what we had just talked about. Albany Business Review reporter Michael DeMasi wrote a series of investigative stories about the 485A program starting in 2017, which found that the tax breaks in Albany were often given erroneously to properties that did not have commercial space. Some of the exemptions were overturned in 2019. The new legislation is meant to prevent that from happening. Starting January 1st, the 485A exemption will, number one, limit the type of commercial uses that can qualify for the exemption and require them to be publicly accessible. Number two, require at least 40% of a building to be used for residential purposes and at least 15% of the building to be used for commercial purposes. Number three, require the commercial part of the building to be currently used as such or plan to be used as such in good faith. Number four, require an annual certification to the assessor attesting that the property complies with the requirements. And number five, require a revocation of benefits if the property is non-compliant and imposes a penalty if a material misstatement is made on an application. So essentially what they did was went through and closed a bunch of little loopholes here that will hopefully make that exemption, I'm sorry, that property tax exemption um, of value for the right reasons to the right developers so that it's not being misused into the future. So we'll see how that plays out as things progress here in New York State. There was a couple of other things here that I wanted to take a quick look at. Paid sick leave is now um, a new law as part of the state's budget in 2021. So there's some more information here. Here's what it requires. Employers with fewer than five employees and a net income of less than 1 million must provide workers with up to 40 hours unpaid sick leave a year. Uh, employers with five to 99 employees, those with fewer than five employees and a net income of more than 1 million uh, must provide workers with up to 40 hours of paid sick leave Employers with 100 or more employees must provide workers with up to 56 hours of paid sick leave per year, uh, and the time would be accrued at a rate of at least one hour per every 30 hours worked. Um, tagging onto that, the minimum wage increased in upstate New York. Again, most of this is relevant if you're one of our New York State viewers. Uh, the hourly minimum wage in New York, in upstate New York is increasing from 12.50 to 12.50 from 11.80. That was effective on December 31st. So there's been quite a few changes um, with regards to labor law, and then obviously with regards to that 485A property tax exemption that I wanted to kind of bring to you guys so that you had a feel for what was going on out there. Let's jump over to a little bit of humor here. Um, this one I feel deep in my bones, especially living in Buffalo. I have encountered some massive potholes lately. Um, <laughs> it's, it's crazy how quickly potholes develop once you start getting a couple of freeze and thaw cycles, and it's so common here in Western New York. Um, but that's, that's definitely, I feel that one in my soul just from, from living here in the Buffalo market. If your contractor tries to tell you that this is an acceptable job, you need to find a new contractor. Um, I think I pulled this one from Rob Giuseppetti's website, uh, off of, or I'm sorry, off of his Facebook page. He's a home inspector with Pillar to Post here in Western New York. Um, man, that is, that's really rough. Um, <laughs> a cover plate is like 49 cents at Home Depot or Lowe's, you know? It's just one of those things that uh, some people more have more, uh, more time than common sense, I'm afraid. So let's jump into our questions from landlords around the country. We're going to start with this one. Liable for the tenant's pet. Do you require some kind of liability animal insurance from your tenant? Am I, as a landlord, liable if my tenant's dog attacks the next door neighbor? So if you allow pets in your apartments, you should have a pet agreement attached to your lease. That's the first thing. And that pet agreement should specify that the tenant needs to carry renter's insurance that covers the animals as well and names you as the landlord as an additional insured. In some states, you can't mandate rental, uh, rental insurance coverages. Uh, but if you're in a state where you can, definitely mandate those coverages because it has the potential to really save you in the long run if something like this, exactly what you just said, happens where somebody gets bit. So 
There are a couple of things that you can do on your end to protect yourself as the landlord. Check with your insurance company to find out what their policy is regarding animals and make sure that you have a full understanding of any breed restrictions that may be in place or anything along those lines. So talk to your insurance company as well. Make sure that they're aware that there's an animal on the property um, and find out if they have any sort of exemptions or anything like that with regards to animals. So that does get worked into insurance policies sometimes. Um, let me think what else we want to touch on here. Carry a uh, liability umbrella, actually. That's when you're talking to your insurance company, you might want to consider taking on a liability umbrella, like an umbrella insurance policy above and beyond your property insurance. They are not expensive. To, I think my, I think I'm carrying, I think the policy that I'm carrying, the umbrella policy that I'm carrying is only like another 200 or $250 a year for a pretty substantial amount of coverage. I'm pretty sure it's a, a two million umbrella. It's worth it just because you never know what's gonna happen. And, and having that little bit of extra coverage for the very small amount of money that it actually costs you is certainly worth it. Um, definitely talk to your insurance company about a liability umbrella and how that needs to be set up such that it covers whatever might happen above and beyond the limits of your property insurance on your properties. They're not generally that expensive and it's certainly worth investigating it. All of that being said, if your tenant's dog bites someone on your property, at least here in the state of New York, they practice what I like to call shotgun law. Fire a lawsuit off at everybody and see what sticks. Uh, you're gonna get sued, essentially, is what I'm saying here. Whether you're right, wrong, or indifferent doesn't matter at that point, because once you're named in the lawsuit, you still have to pay to defend yourself. You're gonna wind up paying some kind of a deductible to your insurance company, for them to send representation out for you or whatever the case may be. You know, once once the dog bite happens, it's too late to make sure that your insurance coverages are up to date and everything else. So, you know, if a tenant has an animal and that animal bites someone, yeah, you're probably gonna get sued. Um, make sure that you have coverages in place to ensure that you're protected and make sure that your tenants are taking on renter's insurance to make sure that they are protected. Uh, and that's pretty much where I wanna leave that one, I think. Um, actually, there's one other thing I wanted to mention on this. If you are dealing with an emotional support animal or a service animal, there are some different changes on things like that. One of the things that we did want to mention is that breed restrictions don't apply to emotional support animals and service animals. So if you have an insurance company that has breed restrictions on, say, German Shepherds, and your incoming tenant has a German Shepherd as a service animal, um, the, your insurance company has to allow that animal. They can't have a breed restriction against an ESA or a service animal. So that's something to keep in mind. We could, we could seriously have an entire episode about ESAs and service animals. If that's something that you guys are interested in, let us know. We'll look into getting an expert on that topic to come in and, and help us with that episode because that's a really in-depth topic. And it's one of those things that landlords could really kind of stick, uh, you know, stick their foot in the wrong place and in a little bit of trouble with something like that. So if you are interested in ESAs, let us know. We'll get a, a topic expert on and we'll do a video on that as well. HOA demands the lease. Does anyone in a does anyone have a rental in a community with a homeowners association? I just received an email from the homeowners association saying that they need a copy of my whole lease agreement. I find this very odd as I handle everything with the unit. Also, I'm willing to provide contact information but they don't need to know what I'm charging, etc. I'm in South Carolina. Does anyone have any insight? Homeowners associations suck. I'm just going to start by saying that. Anybody I've talked to who's ever had to deal with a homeowners association has never had a good experience, us included. We've dealt with one homeowners association in the past. Um, they were not great. Um, as far as what we had to provide, we had to provide a copy of the lease the first page and the signature page of the lease we had to provide the first page and signature page of our management agreements and i think we had to provide the tenant's contact information name and phone number but we blacked out everything that we didn't think that they needed to see so they didn't have any idea what the rent rate was or you know any of that information uh, the property management agreement we blocked out anything that we didn't think that they needed to see and they really didn't harass us too deeply on it which was nice the problem with HOAs is they basically have the ability to make your life a living hell if they so choose to do so. And typically you'll find with a lot of these HOAs, the board members are residents in the community with 
either an ax to grind or they're retired and have nothing better to do. You know, I'm sure you've all heard horror stories about people who have planted the wrong color of flower in front of their in front of their property and the HOA sends them a violation letter or something like that. HOAs can be very, very, very difficult to work with. So find out what's required by the HOA rules. Do what you have to do to comply with those rules to the extent that you're able to. Uh, and just keep on moving forward. Generally speaking, unless you're starting to have lease violations or something like that, more than likely the HOA is gonna stay out of your hair. Um, one thing that you should know or check into before you even sign a lease is whether or not that HOA even permits rentals. Some HOAs have a limit to the number of rentals allowed in a development so that they don't wind up overrun with renters. Make sure that you are you know, checking that box off to ensure that you're even able to rent the place properly. Um, based on whatever restrictions are in place under the HOA. HOAs are not fun to deal with. Uh, it sucks that you're in that situation, but you're probably just gonna have to try to make the best of it, unfortunately. Lease renewal time. So I've got two questions on here because they were very similar in nature. First question was, our current lease ends on 228-21, but goes month to month thereafter. Is there any benefit to notifying our tenant of this? And the second question is, when is the best time of the year for a rent adjustment? I've heard late spring, utility bills are lower, so tenants feel like they have a little extra cash. If the tenant moves in in the spring, the landlord doesn't have to run the AC. The typical 12-month lease then expires next spring uh, when there may be more prospective new tenants looking. So I combine these two questions because I think that they're kind of similar in nature. You should definitely reach out to your tenant and find out what their plan is going to be moving forward at the end of their lease term. Whether or not they plan on renewing, um, you know, maybe offer them, hey, do you want a one-year lease at whatever rent rate, or do you want to go month to month at a little bit higher rent rate? That might be an option for you if that's something that you're considering. Um, let me think, what else would the lease renewal time? If they're not planning on renewing, you're going to need to know that so that you can start planning for a vacancy. So definitely don't just ignore the fact that the tenant's lease is ending, even if it rolls automatically to a month to month, have a conversation with that tenant, find out what their plan is, if they want to stay, if they want a one-year lease, or if you want to offer a one-year lease versus a month to month or whatever, those are decisions and conversations that can be had with your tenant when you reach out to have that conversation. As far as what's the best time of the year for a rent adjustment, if that tenant's on a lease, lease renewal is the best time for a rent adjustment. Uh, in terms of how much you can adjust rent, that's going to be a little bit specific depending on the state and possibly even your municipality. Um, I know here in New York, there are a couple of different rules that you have to follow if you're raising rent more than 5%, things of that nature. So typically speaking, if I'm making a change to what the rent is going to be on a unit, I'm doing it at that lease renewal time. More often than not, that's the only legal time for you to make that change if they're on a lease. And then obviously, if they're month to month, you probably have a little bit more leeway as to how that set of circumstances is handled. But that's what I would do. I would have a conversation with the tenant, find out if they're staying or going. Um, do you want a year lease? Do you want a month to month? And again, that's up to you if you want to offer just one year leases or just month to month or whatever. Depends on what your scenario is individually. Uh, and then if you're going to make an adjustment to the rent, that's probably the best time to make that adjustment as well. Dryer not drying. So this is an interesting one. If a gas dryer gets warm but not hot on even a 60 minute drying cycle, uh, doesn't completely dry things the first go around, does that mean that the element is going bad? And then the second question, uh, did anyone experience dryer running but no heat problem? What is the rough cost? This info will help me to decide either repair or purchase a new one. I'm not sure what to do right now. My property is in Kissimmee, Florida. I appreciate any information that you guys can give. Thank you. Um, so just a couple little pieces of uh, diagnostic info that you can do before bringing a repair person out or something like that. Check your basics first. Check the lint trap to make sure it's clean. Check the vent to make sure that it's clean, that there's no uh, buildup of lint inside the vent or especially where the little louvers are on the outside of the building. Sometimes you'll get vents that'll get, the lint will get caught up on those little louvers. Definitely check your vent, make sure that's clean all the way through because if that vent is blocked up, a lot of times the dryer will not, will not fire. It'll recognize that it's not able to off gas properly. It'll just shut itself down. So check that stuff first. Check all your electric and gas connections. That would be the next thing that I would check into. No heat usually winds up being either a flame sensor or a heating element, something along those lines. Occasionally, it'll be a timer or a controller, and those can be a little bit more expensive. At that point, it might not necessarily be advantageous for you to spend the money on the new appliance, I'm sorry, on repairing the appliance versus 
spending the money on just purchasing a new appliance, that might be the better route for you to go. If you're a DIY person, I do have a resource that I want to bring up so that you guys can take a look here. This is appliancepartspros.com. This is probably one of the better resources out there for the DIY person who wants to try to make an appliance repair. And uh, it's a very simple site to use. If you have the make and model of your appliance, you can type it into the system. I have pulled up here a Frigidaire 18 cubic foot refrigerator. It's one of the most common refrigerators that we use in our uh, apartments, which is why I pulled this up. But when you type in the model number, the first thing you're presented with is a diagram, a diagram of all the various components. So if you're not sure what a part is called or whatever, all you have to be able to do is find that part. Let me see here. Can I get one of these to blow up? Uh, all you have to do is be able to find that part in the list down here. And they always have a list of the parts with photos and, and things like that. There we go. I got it to open up. Uh, let's see. I don't want the wiring schematic. Let's look at the cabinet. Give that a second to load. Their site's a little bit slow this morning. So here you basically have the fridge and you can see all the various components that go into it. Um, it's very easy to find the part that you're looking for when you have this up because you can literally just look at, okay, well, where does the part fit into it? And then everything is very easy to find. It's all easily numbered and everything else. So for instance, let's find part number 22. Part number 22, and this is one of those little obnoxious things. Part number 22, because this is a reversible style door, you can put the hinges on either side. So part number 22 is the tiny little white plugs that go in the spaces opposite where you have your door hinge. So now you know what part you need. You would just scroll down on the list until you find part number 22, button plug. You can click on it, get a little bit bigger photo, hopefully. Tough to see, but it is right there, that little white plug that sits in there. So you can get that, it gives you the part number, Sometimes I'll take that part number, I'll go right to Amazon and do a search to see if Amazon has the part cheaper than Appliance Parts Pros. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But this is a great little resource to help you if you're trying to find a part for an appliance and you're not sure where to get the part or what the part's called, something along those lines. A great little site. If you've got the make model number of your appliance, it's very easy for you to find that sort of information. And look, they have basically everything that you're looking for, crisper pans and you know the glass drawer inserts and everything else. They, not, they won't necessarily have the availability of all the parts if it's an older appliance, um, but I've found that pretty much anything within the last five-ish years, it's pretty easy to locate parts for, uh, especially when it comes to sites like this. So that's my, my tip for the day. If you are in a situation where you're trying to find some appliance parts, that's a good place to start, a good place to look, a good place of resource for you to kind of help you find what you're looking for. One other thing I wanted to mention, I'm gonna go back to desktop mode here for one second. They actually have some free repair tips here as well. If you go to their site and hit get repair help, you can kind of start clicking through, so we'll click dryers uh, and we'll say there's no heat and it basically starts running you through the diagnostics of, okay, we'll start checking here, 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 whatever to see what, what the potential problem might be. So definitely a cool little resource. It's great to know that there's stuff like that out there. If you're a DIYer, if you're looking to see if it's worth it to even try to fix an appliance versus buying a new one, a lot of times once you start looking at the component cost, you're gonna realize very, very quickly, if you're not doing the work yourself, it's, it's gonna become very, very rapidly become an expensive situation. And you, a lot of times you wind up being better off just replacing the entire appliance if you've got a couple of more expensive components, like a glass top on a stove, very expensive to replace. So that is our, that's actually our last question of the day, everybody. So we're gonna jump into our post stream social media here. Thank you all so much for joining us. I truly do appreciate it. I'm super pumped to be back here in 2021 after having a successful year of the show in 2020. Um, every episode that we produce is produced because we love producing the show. That's the fact of life. Like it's, it's a labor of love. There's not a revenue generating thing happening here. We do this show because we want to get the information out to everybody so that we can try to better educate people who are in the real estate market, in the investment market, trying to figure out 
what they want to do, buy, not buy, et cetera, et cetera. So as, a, as I was saying, we love producing Ask a Property Manager and you can always to help us improve, drop a question in the comments, either on Facebook or YouTube, and your question may be answered in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this content or if we brought some value today, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback. So every like, comment, subscription, and share helps us to grow and reach more people. We'll be back next Wednesday on January 13th, 10 a.m. Eastern with another show that you won't want to miss. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.